Hello and welcome to Climb's podcast series, Advancing Vietnam, with me, Vlad Savin, as your host. Throughout the following episodes, we're looking to answering relevant questions about doing business in Vietnam. What are the opportunities and challenges faced by investors entering the market or existing players in major industries? We will seek to understand the business environment from a cultural, local mindset and how to deal with compliance from an international perspective. What are the major risks faced by uh, businesses active in the region and how to overcome them? We will dive deep into the compliance environment in Vietnam, discussing processes and procedures, changes in laws, latest official updates from the authorities and financial governance planning for businesses active in Vietnam. We at the client consider compliance a major asset for foreign investors operating in Vietnam. We emphasize this aspect when speaking with our clients and we make sure they understand the significant benefits of being compliant. In this episode, I'm discussing with Matthew Lowry, managing partner at Acclaim Vietnam, about how foreign investors can deal with tax inspections in Vietnam, what are the best practices when preparing for a tax inspection, case studies and other important prerequisites to minimize non-compliance and statutory risks. Matthew, welcome again to our Advance in Vietnam podcast series. This topic is of significant importance for uh, investors in Vietnam due to its complex and also subjective approach when dealing with the different authorities from different provinces, cities and um, regions in, in Vietnam. I'm excited to share with our listeners about how inspections happen in practice and how uh, investors can protect themselves and their businesses uh, when dealing with the tax authorities. Great to be here today and yeah, let's have a chat and go through some of the experiences and lessons. So Matthew, how do tax inspections start and how do they work in, in practice? So tax inspections, um, the, the, the concept is that all companies should expect to have an inspection at some stage. Um, we'll go in a bit detail later about how they're selected and what the process is, but the assumption is you will be inspected. That's the premise of in Vietnam, and that, and that is a pretty much for every business can attest to that. Um, the selection process is a little bit um, systemized and a little bit ad hoc. It depends on the tax authority in the provincial and the district authority that you're dealing with, um, where they will pick. They'll have a target, revenue is their, one of their starting points. They'll have a whole range of risk factors with all the technology where they'll rank companies. So people dealing with high risk sectors who have been inspected before, had issues before, they'll rate them. And so what comes out is um, lists based on how long since they've had an inspection. They have a list and they will allocate that out and they put targets against those. Mm -hmm. So they've got a systemized approach and then there is a random element put into that as well. So those, that selection process is risk weighted, um, risk weighted, partly randomized selection with targets, targets for budgets and targets that they would expect a similar company of penalties and taxes that would arise from the process. Mm -hmm. And how often do they generally occur? You said it's sometimes randomized and sometimes uh, systemized through their, their specific goals. How, how, how would investors be prepared based on this, this timeline of expectation? Your, your normal rule is that every five years you'll be inspected. Mm -hmm. It is quite common for it to happen every two or three years for certain companies. Mm -hmm. And those who don't have it after five, you'll get it before 10. And we do see that occasionally they slip to that. Um, just as an aside, historically, the longer, so if, you've got, if you haven't had a five-year inspection, which does occur, not commonly, um, I've had people, sort of clients, quite happy that their the seven or eight years never been inspected. They then get notified and discover their records from six, seven years ago no longer exist. And that exposes them more than anything. I'm not because it's a paper-based, desk-based inspection in practice, not having those documents. So this not being inspected for a long time has a significant drawback from um, records and access to the individuals that were involved in preparation of those records mm -hmm. at the time. And some of our clients actually uh, mentioned this and our stakeholders from the community that uh, some businesses, particularly in manufacturing, they sometimes get inspected on a yearly basis. Mm. Why does that, that well, happen? Why you... Some of them ask for it. Some of them it's an internal control process. So occasionally, I wouldn't say the majority of, and historically it's get, um, they used to do this more, it's getting harder to get a tax inspection. There's a transaction, there's a clean up, let's get an inspection or have a regular inspection to make sure we're not carrying exposure long term. But the most of what you're talking about is if they've been, um, if they're a high risk sector and they've had penalties in the past, they're quite often annualized in that process. The authorities, again at the start, the tax authorities have targets of tax revenue they need to maintain and they've target tax inspection recoveries they want to get. So they've got to work out what's the easiest place to get my tax 
from from these parties. So so from that perspective, absolutely, it's um, it is something commonly you see people regularly until they're no longer an easy target. They no longer have a tax exposure. So let's go then a bit more granular. What are the tax authorities really looking at? under a tax inspection, uh, yeah. what are the key areas of uh, their focus? So a tax inspection is, um, we call it a tax inspection, it is really a business inspection. It mm -hmm. is looking at everything you do from your business lines, your activities, what you're doing, making sure it's compliant. That's your main exposure when it comes to Vietnam from inspection because they bring it all together. They can refer things to labour authorities and insurance. Um, it is the biggest exposure. It's looking at your records. Have you been a Vietnamese accounting standards compliant? Remember, Vietnamese um, accounting standards are tax standards. So you, have you been following those, doing your vouchers? Um, what have you been doing? And do you have contracts to support everything? Do you have a dossier for each of your transactions? They're looking at, fundamentally, your systems and processes. Do you have everything in place? One step more, they're looking for risks. They're looking to identify opportunities where they can get penalties. A tax inspectors, their prime target is not to be feel good and say, yeah, you're a great company, um, as much as we'd like that. Their, their job is to raise revenue for the state. So they are looking for opportunities. So generally when they're approaching, they will be trying to identify areas where you're non-compliant. If you've got lots of staff, they might focus on staffing. They might focus on if they've seen um, other companies with cost of goods sold and, and purchasing uh, issues. They will focus on those areas. They'll try to find your exposure. It's not that you're necessarily right or wrong, because remember, as you said at the start, Vlad, laws in Vietnam have a little bit of flexibility and interpretation. They may take a position to flush something out. And so they're looking at risks and exposure. And it's broad. It really is depending upon your business sector. But they will not generally go through everything and, and hit everything. They're, they're smarter than that. And they will focus in on those areas where they're more likely to um, make a, a revenue positive for the government position out of it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at the beginning how the tax inspections start and how companies get chosen uh, more or less by the tax authorities. What happens next? Uh, the tax authorities issue a letter and then what is that process where investors need to figure out how to be part of it efficiently for their business? Yeah, I interestingly, um, the letter should be the first point of contact. Mm -hmm. it, it often is. Commonly, though, we do see the tax officer will call the chief accountant. I'm doing an inspection, send some documents across. They'll start a verbal dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the advice is do not. Do not entertain that. Say, great, fantastic, look forward to your advice. I'm not allowed to share any information until I have the written document. That stamped document of inspection is really important. And during the process, the written documentation is important. The tax authorities um, or certain officers will try to make it verbal as much as possible. They're not going to put it down in writing because they're going to be bound by that. They're going to want you to do things and then the final decisions in writing, they want to negotiate. So quite often you'll see that they'll contact, there's an inspection coming up, I need these documents, here's my email address, <laughs> regularly a Gmail address, believe it or not, um, which just scares me and another reason why you don't just send something to someone who's calling up and um, wanting. Um, and they do intimidate. They really intimidate accountants. So let's just put that out there. They are intimidatory because this inspection aura. So when they contact, it's always acknowledge, ask for it in writing. That stops it as a fishing expedition as well because a um, the normal approach of um, inspection is it's limited to what's in the documentation. But if you're talking to a tax inspector and sharing and telling, all of a sudden he's just widened off narrow scope and if it's not covered, it may be covered by a separate inspection. If it's in that document, they can't come back and do it again as a general rule. It's defined, that's the inspection. So you're, you're, you don't want to give them opportunities. You want it in writing and that's it. It's a finite in writing. And so never share documents unless you have it in writing with a stamp because that tax officer has to get his, his superior to stamp that to justify what's in that document mm -hmm. and they'll be bound by that. So that um, verbal versus written, and that comes through to a further to inspection process. We see the authorities argue points, points of law, they're trying to trap you and they're using verbal. And I saw some recently where they were arguing things which are completely factually incorrect from a legal perspective, but they were arguing and they had to fight. And that idea was put in writing and we'll respond in writing. Uh, they were prepared to do that because there was just nothing to put in writing. Mm -hmm. um, but they gave them power to distract and gave them power to negotiate and move things mm -hmm. on because they had this, this argument over them. Well, 
just don't entertain it. You discuss with him, but respond to all matters. You made accusations of this, put in writing. It just deal with it in writing because it comes back to factual evidence, not intimidation, which happens in the verbal process, just simply because of the nature of an inspection. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned then the authorities' point of view where they use various types of tools like arguing intimidation, putting out laws and different types of uh, components, legal components that may or not may not be factual. Then on the other side, looking at the foreign investor, what would be a best practice from their from the, from uh, from from their side to actually protect themselves and be able to deal with the authorities in a professional manner. So you mentioned, you know, uh, keep everything in writing. What else would you would you add? Um, you use a third party. It, it's have that independent party sitting between you because the authorities want to eyeball the investor. They want to eyeball the company, and it's that intimidation. They want to, you know, play the game. Mm -hmm. They've got an outcome, and that outcome may be um, tenuous or it may be legally based, but they want that. And if they remove emotion by having a third party who has no physical or emotional attachment, it's very hard to intimidate and do the same thing. It's like, no, that's not the law, sorry, no. Um, mm -hmm. Versus, oh no, what's gonna happen if I fight them? Um, so that third party takes the power away from the tax authorities to use intimidatory act um, actions. Mm -hmm. So I, I would always say get a third party to sit in those meetings. The tax authorities will want to see the legal rep. Sure, have the legal rep in say hi, these are my, these are my parties, um, let me know when you've finished discussing the matters and I'll go through the final matters. So make yourself accessible, but not the centre of the, of the process. Mm -hmm. um, and the third party does frustrate the authorities because they can't use that. The, now, when the authorities are doing it, they're going to raise a whole range of issues, some correct, some incorrect. They're trying to, um, quite often, negotiate to a point, negotiate to, a, to, a, to an amount. And they'll use these um, less than act legally accurate claims as part of their greater claim quite often and to make these, you negotiate to these factual claims. So, oh, it, you know, we've got 10, 10 billion dong of pen, potential penalties, but look, if we only agree these 5 billion, um, we'll, you know, others you go, okay, well, I've got it from 10 to 5. Well, you, it was only ever those 5 anyway that you were dealing with. So, so they will use those um, as part of the process and having a third party is going, no, we're dealing with five, we're not, we're not 10, we're exposed, <laughs> it's that five and we don't agree with that is the way to go. So that's where you're, mm -hmm. you're, you need to have that removal, removal of the personal interest to mm -hmm. really get a good outcome. Uh, you mentioned before about, about power and leverage power, leveraging power, especially from the authority side. Uh, what about the investor side? Do they actually have power into, let's say, fighting with the authorities or, or protecting their business at the same level? or they're fully exposed, then they will just have to kind of, you know, negotiate and agree with, uh, with some terms. There's a negotiation process. So the first negotiation revolves around, you do need to have a minute of acceptance and go through, and you may not agree. You will have to, if they've issued a penalty notice to you as a result of the inspection, agreeing or not, you need to pay that and then fight it. So, so you can't just fight it, you actually have to pay that and then fight. But by going in writing in the process, you are making it very difficult then to issue a penalty notice based on the in, incorrect information. And that's why that um, we, we see far too often full verbal negotiations and the only written document is the minutes of acceptance at the end. It, it, it's, it's, it's bizarre in that way, but we see that really, really often. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that is the authorities are looking to intimidate and scare you and they're so, uh, unfortunately, some of them are in it for self-interest. There is a personal, there is a, a part of the tax process where there's money going to pockets of individuals where they go, well, instead of that five billion, um, I've got a target of one billion. So if you can give me some money, I'll get it down to one billion because he still meets the internal target and you're better off than paying five billion. We see that and that, that, that um, written documents sort of makes it harder for them to do that process. So we will see a verbal until the very last minute. If you then go and object, you don't have that trail to object as easy about incorrect assessment. So it's a bit of a game, and unfortunately there is a, a, an element of um, power that the tax authorities have that's very hard to take off them. And as well, if you enter into this process of um, let, not so legal negotiation techniques, then what happens next for the foreign investor? next year and the next year as you said at the very start that what puts them on the list that puts them on the list they are then someone they're a, in someone who pays and someone who pays money it's got to be a higher choice of i need to meet my targets 
Again, those internal tax office targets are critical for meeting the Treasury's requirements and the government, but also the individuals. If they do have a corrupt nature, and, and, and they do exist, let's be honest, they do exist, um, they're, they're going to go for the easier targets. So those who do not pay, those who fight, those who follow process, and those who have a history of not having, uh, of, of just doing it right in the first place, will likely have a much larger, longer period between inspection because you just don't rise to the top of the list when they're doing their risk profiling. So then let's look at what are the not so easy targets. What can foreign investors do to protect themselves somehow from the outset when arriving at that uh, meeting with the authorities of the tax inspection? What can they actually do to be protected before? Oh, it's, well? it's, 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 it's well before that. It's knowing you're going to be inspected and at all times, your internal compliance processes, your reviews, it's that VAS base of your accounting, it is doing it all properly in, from an inspection perspective, knowing they'll inspect, that the authorities will inspect. Um, we commonly see companies who take an IFRS accounting base and then they'll convert to VAS at the end of the year. That creates sloppy, it creates risk. If you just do it properly at all time with a VAS accounting base and convert to IFRS as you go, um, if you make sure your documentation, if you're internally checking, if you're doing your regular compliance review, get an external party to come in and do a quick check. Find where those risk exposure points are. So when the authorities come in and they ask for things, they've got your piece of paper, they've got a stamped document from the tax authority saying we're inspecting, this is what we require. The documents you provide them, you'll know that they'll tie up and they're coming from a couple of different ways. They've got great techniques where they'll look at balance sheets and trial balances, they'll look at processes, they'll look at dossiers, and they'll start treading, going through to make sure they're tying up. And they'll, they're pretty good at knowing when someone's made it up at the end of the year versus, um, and they'll just take the, uh, the negotiation point of, oh, I've got you here, versus you do it properly at all times and you've given us, and we, there's no loose ends to start with. They have to dig down on technical tax treatment of transactions if you know that everything's at an order. So the, the first defense is do it beforehand. Don't wait to a tax inspection before you start getting things in order. Assume you're always going to be inspected and you'll be okay. The, t the moment that the tax inspectors gives you that document, you give it to them, you don't fight, but, and that you minimize the verbal discussions. And you can talk with them, give them what they want, but do not feed them, do not do it. I, I've seen inspections where the tax authorities have um, mentioned things which are completely incorrect, but they clearly come from the company because they've told and explained something in an incorrect way and the tax authorities grab that. And well, who told them that? That was a verbal discussion that someone's had. And that's because they're good at it. They're on the phone, they're talking face to face, they're trying to get that out. Don't minimize that verbal discussion. Only what's requested. Don't offer more because they will use that against you. Right, and in the same time, that verbal discussion may happen, you know, right in the office of the company. So they may come in, two or three officers, they can start discussing with, you know, all the stakeholders involved. How long does this uh, process usually take and how do you minimize the verbal discussions when people are in your office verbally communicating with you? Um, they spend less time in the office than you would think. It's very much, they, they prepare, they want documents in advance, they want soft copies now. It's, it is more digital now, they've got records. And sometimes they ask something and your answer is, you've got that in the system already. They'll go, yeah, we know, but we wanna see if you can give it to us again. Um, so they've got access to a lot of information and it is not a dumb system. That people assume that the authorities don't, they know a lot. So let's just be honest, they know that. I'm talking the commercial versus the, the, the technical compliance side. Um, so they will spend a few days in your office almost confirming and inspecting their risk areas. They're, they're, there's a lot of soft documents they'll ask for and you'll be sending them documents in advance that they're mm. looking through. Um, it's not a lot of days. The process can take anything from, um, from a month or so from start to finish. It is normally sort of two to three months um, start to finish, but it can go much, much longer. At a point, the authorities want to close it off. The inspector will need to finish his part. He'll need to hand it in back to the authorities because he's on a timeline. He's got his list of companies. He's got his target to meet. So his or her, um, and they will close it off. And it may not be completed as far as you're concerned. He'll close it off so he can pass it to the next step up and you can object. And so it, it won't go on. Sometimes they will issue a document for inspection. Um, they'll start collecting documents and they'll go, no, no, and you won't hear from any more. And effectively that, that period will expire. You, we do see that from time to time. Um, there's questions whether that they can redo that because they never did the inspection. I've seen arguments uh, around that, um, but it, it sometimes it's not um, unheard of that they will start an inspection and just through to um, 
resource availability and risk and ability to get money for the state and they'll just disappear and focus on something else and um, you'll hear from them later on, they'll just forget that period. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what would be interesting uh, to share with our listeners is maybe one or two examples or, or case studies um, which you're aware of where investor in one case could be a, a, a potentially non-compliant business and then the issues arise in that situation and how, how the, in, the, the entire inspection happened then and then potentially a, a successful uh, a case study as well where the investor was able to stand their point and to, to protect their business uh, against various uh, manipulation tools. The, the, the best example I have was uh, actually a wind-up, to give you an example, was a wind-up scenario where um, up on wind-up of a company that traded for a while then um, didn't have a need, technology business that I um, remember, that the, the inspection for wind-up, and a wind-up inspection is still the same as a tax inspection, it's inspecting the historical periods. Um, the outcome, the initial um, advice from the authority on inspection notice was quite unfavourable. There was a number of um, um, errors that were claimed in tax penalties. Um, by the end of it, there was a refund issued. And that's, and that's the standing the ground. So what the process was, where they were arguing there was a technical um, thing, item that was not followed given there was a change in the investment law and that was a certain one document was not lodged and therefore they've argued a penalty arose from that period moving forward. Um, by, again, corresponding in writing, constantly arguing in writing, we un understand this is what we have followed, this was the guidance, and here is gu um, guidance from the authorities that we followed, which, are, which meant that we were still in compliance. We understand your position against the law, we're following guidance. That argument, by keeping it in writing, to the point where they ended up um, moving on. But in the process, further arguments in writing about the refunds for VAT and other things that were due that the authorities verbally had just discounted and refused to deal with, came in and so the the authorities were not only backpedaling on one part they were they were going back so you if you keep it in writing and focus on the facts and focus on what matters and you know you are correct with substance you can end up and though that example we were talking not a very large amount of money but that process was about almost frustrating them into just let, let this go um this is not going to be the outcome that I was looking for. There's no point fighting it, and they're right. They have basis. So this is where, by having that independent party who has no vested interest other than the best interest of their client, but no emotional interest, um, manage to just use that written and use facts. And I think that's a, that's the example where I would, would, would suggest is to follow, is that in writing, use facts, understand the law and remove emotion so that there's no there's no ability so, so you you can't trade off something because it's just it's facts and that's where you're in a better position mm -hmm. and as we talked before um, uh, easy targets for the authorities in many cases are part of the, the manufacturing sector because they have a broad range of products import, employees, import, staff. import export stock staff you've got all the risk process and yeah. uh, do you have any uh, any um, potential maybe example of a manufacturing facility that had to deal with uh, with tax authorities and how complex the situation was for them yeah the, it, it, it's very different per facility but the authorities spend more time in manufacturing because of those risk areas you've got far more areas because do do all the in, the customs documentations in the customs system match the tax systems well they can do that offline and they're doing that and they're matching and finding out. So they know where the exposure points, um, you know, import, re-export, certain number of days, how many kilograms, what was done, local market, what the declarations. The cost of your cost of goods sold, your formulas, your, your manufacturing, your wastage rates, they're going to go through and look at those things. And they almost know, they've got that, they, they've got a guess and a target of how much money they can get out. They will sit there and um, use that tool before they've walked in for what they expect. And it is a matter of you know, standing your ground, knowing that you have done the right thing, knowing that you know how those rules work. And I've seen inspections um, pivot to transfer pricing, not as a transfer pricing inspection in factory, but using that as a tool to negotiate other elements to say, well, you're not compliant on that, so we're going to be pushing you here to, in order to negotiate a, a fee. And we see the penalties, and it might be a stock um, usage, so import, re-export, that a certain amount was going into domestic market as waste and they're arguing that it was too high, therefore they, you've, you've, you've abused the um, duty-free import for re-export process and they will argue that I'm going to penalise you but if we can agree on a, we'll agree on an amount, we won't, we won't um, delve further. 
If you've got confidence in the ratios, in your process, in your cost of goods sold calculations, in that wastage and that, that usage rates, you, you say, no, we're not agreeing. We, we have the documentation, we have the evidence. And they, they play the games. The more times that they can sit there and, um, and intimidate, the more chance they have to, to get more out of you. The last thing we'll say is, if factories are doing excess overtime, if factories are doing local sales and aren't declaring where they're an exporter, if they're doing anything that is not compliant, you've, you've, you've always got an exposure in any discussion and all they need to do is find one of those. They will, they will find them. Then you're negotiating on how much and does he take some in his pocket for the inspector if that's the case, you, you, you're in a position where it's very hard to defend and argue the high, the high road of oh, we're not paying anything, we're not paying, we're right. It's tough to do that. So also to reinforce what you were saying before, uh, hoping that the tax authorities won't discover that specific issues which you know that uh, exists uh, is not something that uh, any any international investor should uh, should imagine that it's happened. The authorities yeah. do have knowledge and they know exactly what's happening from and, a commercial point of view. And, and the alternate, where you hear the stories, the local, oh, let's go and you pay money for local. Well, that's the let's call it yeah. local approach where. The local company is non-compliant. If they're paying cash money and they're non-receipt, they've got very little controls and process. Tax authority walks in and says, this is how much money I need. What? It's simply a negotiation on how much that's going to be. That's the honest answer for how that works in a local company. A foreign company, we're expecting to be fully compliant. You should, Vietnam, be compliant. You're, you, that's what's an expectation of a foreign company. In that case, you're not sitting there negotiating a fee up front with the authorities, unless you're not compliant. So that's that basis for, and here in the local market, that when the tax man's coming, you just end up paying some money, negotiate amount, because the non-compliant nature of the business forces that, not because that's the expectation you should be doing when the tax man comes. Thanks for really practical information, Matthew. To, to close off the discussion, as a summary, uh, what advice would you give to, to an international foreign investor that receives a letter or a phone call from uh, tax authorities Monday, next week, and how should they deal with the process? You know, what's the first step and how should they go through this process um, in, a, in, a, in a very summarized way to encapsulate everything that you okay. said? So before Monday, don't wait till Monday, make sure you have an independent compliance review, not the annual audit. The annual audit is not gonna protect you against tax inspection. Annual audit is a financial statement preparation process. Um, you need to make sure before Monday that you've got an annual or a regular process where some, a third party comes in and checks for your documentation, your processes, and your risk profile when it comes from an inspection. So you need to prepare and, and know where your risks and protect, fix them. When the taxman Monday does make that phone call, great, thank you very much. Can I have the letter? Because I can't do anything till I have the letter. Require that document in writing. That will fix the boundaries of the inspection. And if it's, if it's limited to a certain area, you only need to deal with that area. If it's a verbal, you've, who knows, you can give anything across and it's difficult to defend. Um, you then would need to advise, get your third party advisor in on the process. They may not join the very first process. They may, you, you're better off just letting discussions, internal accounting, internal there, um, deal with the authorities on the first requests and discussions and potentially meeting. But at that next point, bring them in. So the negotiations it needs to involve the third party to protect and remove that emotion. And um, the, this idea that, it is a, um, that it's, the whole process is verbal and we'll get a minute at the end should never be followed. It needs to be in writing and respond in writing to any claims that are made or any accusations, any claims of application of law that you know or believe is incorrect, respond in writing. They may not respond in writing, but you've got the evidence to support and it's very hard for them to make minutes at the end that contradict the facts that you're presenting to them. Make sure you know where your documents are because they're trying to find gaps. So in that when they're calling is the moment if they call, if you haven't done a recent review, quickly do that review internally. So if they call on Monday and you haven't had a compliance review internally, you haven't had someone look, get someone in to help that define where that risk is and protect against it. Find documents, get copies of old documents, get an explanation, find something that will protect as best you can. Matthew, thank you so much again for the practical insights and I think foreign investors would have some really interesting uh, uh, tips and tricks and best practices to use uh, when dealing with tax inspectors. and. Uh, as, as we talked, the expectation should be that everyone will get a tax inspection in the end. So I think it's really important uh, to, for, for them to really understand what are the practicalities here. So thank you again. Great to talk and um, yeah, it, it's just be prepared, be prepared. 
Investors operating in Vietnam should have the expectation that the tax authorities will perform one or more inspection of their activity in Vietnam and they should plan accordingly. Knowing how to be compliant when operating a business in Vietnam is as important as knowing how to deal with the tax authorities when faced with a tax inspection. Prevention is key and this is why we advise international investors to always maintain utmost compliance when operating in Vietnam, thus enabling their business to maintain a strong position in front of the tax authorities. Thank you. And many thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in to Advancing Vietnam podcast series. For more information about this topic, please check out our publications on vietnam.reclime.com. And if you want to reach out to us for any additional details, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or throughout the website contact details. 